Bonjour à vous. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, if you're joining us for this uh, early Sunday morning start, it's uh, 10, 10 a.m. So we're here for a new session of Exxon and I'm very happy to moderate a discussion today uh, between two Belgian people with a title. Uh, of course, we're talking about Europe. Uh, can what new cooperation can we invent for Europe between the 27 members? What new solidarity to face up to an unprecedented crisis? We have uh, uh, Charles Michel, president of the European Council. He will uh, tell us whether Europe can do away with the rules and to invent something new. Some things have already been happening since the beginning of the COVID crisis, and now we will specifically be go getting into uh, the recovery and uh, economic action, uh, social action. And to talk with him, uh, Paul Hermena, who's beside me. Paul Hermena is president of uh, Capgemini, uh, world leader of consulting and digital transformation information, technological services and engineering. It's a very good sensor to understand what's happening today and to what has given rise to the COVID crisis. You're present in 50 countries, more than 170,000 employees. And if, sorry, I'm very sorry. There was a little bit of interference in uh, my headphones there. And I was saying Cap Gemini is a tremendous sensor to understand what has ha happened during this crisis. Of course, digital technology was essential. It, it has contributed to our resilience. And what we will ask you, Paul Ermanon, is, Ermanon, is what companies are expecting from Europe today, but also from the leaders, generally speaking, with relation to the European Union. So I suggest that we now uh, Listen to uh, Charles Michel, and then we'll come back to Paul Amina. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to take the floor for this 20th edition of your uh, Rencontre Économique. This year, we ha it's taking place in an exceptional virtual uh, format, uh, due to, the, and it's within the scope of this exceptional COVID-19 crisis that I wish to begin my presentation and place into perspective what we're trying to do at the European level. The finding is simple and yet incredible. Throughout the world and independently of political orientations, the leaders have adopted extraordinary measures to restrict freedom. The economies have been brought to a halt. Why? To preserve the lives and health of people. And how can this former minister faced with terrorist attacks? I can guarantee that uh, suspending personal fundamental uh, freedom is one of the weightiest decisions and the economic impact uh, is very, very dire. And the European Commission, um, the, the, I'm very sorry, but the reception in the translation booth does not allow us to proceed with the translation because we have two voices on the channel. So we wish to stop the virus, which has, and this fixed the political agenda from the very first days. Very quickly, we realized how terrible the consequences of the pandemic would be for the global economy. On the front line, the national governments assumed their responsibilities and took exceptional measures to support workers and companies. And that was made possible thanks to the decisive action of the European Union. The central bank, bank you know, as from the month of March, took essential decisions to support uh, the economy with 870 billion euros extended in June by 600 additional uh, billion euros. Parallel to this and following the first video conference of the European Council the 10th of March, we decided to uh, relax the framework of state uh, aid and to activate the derogations for measures that a few weeks before were unthinkable. And that allowed us uh, uh, national measures that have never been seen before in their scale and speed. Uh, for the 27 countries, the budgetary measures were represent more than 570 billion euros, 4% of the GDP of Europe, and uh, the support of uh, cash flow. Uh, uh, reached 23% of the GDP. For France, that represented 6% 6 of the budget. Decisive measures were summarized by the few words of the French president, Emmanuel Macron, do everything we can, whatever it costs. If we acted so strongly and fast, it's because we learned the lessons from the financial crisis, in particular with regard to the cascade events of the crisis and its disastrous 
impacts that persisted for the economic players. It is these uh, uh, effects uh, which are very concrete. There were skills that were lost for those uh, that uh, have a long period of unemployment and the know-how of companies disappeared. And if we let this uh, carry on, we will um, hold up the growth of tomorrow. So we wish to really put a stop to this natural chain of events. And it's obvious that not all countries have equal uh, uh, means to face up to the uh, crisis. Therefore, it's necessary to have a European common uh, approach to avoid this crisis from becoming even worse, but to level the playing field and uh, so I'm convinced, and I'm entirely convinced, that uh, a, a European reno, uh, revival based on solidarity uh, requires financial means and is necessary. But we must not use uh, the end objective of this effort. It is to reinforce the convergence and the resilience of our union, as economic and budgetary fragilities of the member states is, of course, a risk for themselves, for each of them, but is also for all of us within an integrated domestic market a very deep risk uh, because we have a single currency. It's right that the European system of governance with regard to the economy and budget that was set up following the debt crisis uh, really, uh, the the the, the uh, state budget suffer from this. And throughout my mandate as a Belgian minis ministry, I can see that the structural uh, the structural changes necessary is very difficult, uh, with many obstacles along the way. And European instruments that were set up in the past, coupled with national reforms, allowed us to react more speedily and more effectively. I. I draw one learning from this experience. Growth alone is not spontaneously virtuous. It, uh, it, unequal opportunities, inequalities, uh, differences, not only uh, uh, feed fear, but they are obstacles to prosperity. Uh, since before the pandemic, the European Union was trying to remedy this, in particular through the adoption in 2007 of a social rights basis, which I believe we should implement even further. Uh, reduce inequalities mean, also means reinforcing economic resilience. I have another conviction. More than ever, we need f f f this uh, double project of a major transformation for Europe. Uh, climate neutrality by 2050, this Green Deal, and the digital transition that should place Europe at the forefront of data exploitation, this natural resource of the digital world. The climate transition, I'm going to spend a bit of time on this, is of course an existential challenge for mankind. It is no longer a question of choice. It is an evidence and a, a strong requirement. It, this a strong requirement is not contrary to economic development. It is even, I believe, a tremendous leverage for prosperity if we make the right choices. And uh, what we need to do is to transform our social market economy economies into a Copernican approach which aims to protect natural sources and drastically reinforce the circular nature of our economies. And the uh, integration decided at the end of last year of the objectives of sustainable development at, at the European semester, which is our uh, economic governance mechanism, it follows the same logic. These transformations were initiated before the crisis, and the pandemic underlined in a very striking manner the interdependence of economic, social, and environmental frameworks. They are not parallel words, and we must uh, approach them together, the only pathway to progress towards robust resilience. There is no doubt there will be other shocks, and we must be better prepared. It's a duty for Europe, and it's the same duty for mankind. Resilience is, moreover, at the heart of the negotiations under way uh, on the pluriannual bu European budget and the, re and the revival fund, which was uh, financed by the uh, uh, loans from the European Union. And so we've gradually moved the question of borrowing and the total amount of aids and uh, uh, loans to the, and the destination of these amounts and the way in which they will be spent. There is another essential lesson to be drawn, I believe, from this extraordinary crisis. The financial crisis 
uh, encouraged us to really try and make our public uh, fi finances more healthy because they're fragile. But this crisis has really put us before something which is essential, personal and collective well-being incarnated by a, a, a kindly society, attentive to other people. And I believe that that should be our new uh, European horizon. Uh, moreover, maybe it is time for us to h hear uh, more about these new measures that are more apt to uh, reflect the performance of our society in terms of prosperity and well-being. And this awakens a debate that is not new for you as economists on the nature of growth, the type of growth, and the fact that it cannot be reduced to the production of value. The reflection that has been begun within the OECD by Joseph Stiglitz, Jean-Paul Fitoussi and Martin Dior and their report named Beyond the GDP, for me, is a source of inspiration. And I quote this report, the use of indicators reflecting what is dear to us as a society would no doubt have led us to a stronger growth than that that most countries experience, have experienced since 2008. Finally, this leads me to the final dimension of this question, maybe the most important one, the di democratic dimension. The climate and digital transition are a positive project, a federating, extraordinary project. But we will not find uh, the adhesion of citizens by uh, brandishing this as the only measure, because it does not reflect the progress felt by people on a daily basis, the quality of the environment, of education, access to health care. Uh, equal opportunities. In one word, the quality of existence should more than ever be at the heart of our ambition. It is beyond the GDP. That is a question. That is something that we call out for. Maybe it's existential for the future of our liberal democracies. The next conference on the future of Europe that will involve, I hope, directly the European citizens must be the democratic opportunity to lead this debate tr with transparency, vitality and passion. A debate that at the outstart uh, is economic, but actually is far broader and which projects us forwards towards a and future. I would like to thank you for your attention and I hope that your discussions are passionate and fruitful. I do apologize for these technical hitches this morning. So, Paul Almela, we just heard Charles Michel, the President of the European Council, uh, saying to us that it is a crisis that is really placing us before what is essential. And Europe, in this moment of truth, was able of really acting fast. We've really broken some taboos. We organized uh, uh, cooperation for Europe and, and the crisis uh, was the risk was that it, it, it increased the differences between the states so we had to reforge our solidarity and he says we did we proceeded with things that we never thought it would be possible to do within the European Union meaning to develop a, a, the famous package as we say in Brussels language of 800 billion euros directly borrowed by the European Union uh, uh, and that will not and the debt will not weigh upon the states that's one of the uh, uh, examples of this European reaction. Do you share the idea that Europe during this crisis really uh, rose and met the challenges that were vital for the European Union and for its t uh, member states? So first of all, I believe that something uh, happened and it's very important and it's very important but we must be honest enough to maybe have a have a more uh, overall view of things what really struck me was that at the beginning of the crisis the fact that the citizens really turned towards their national states and it was brief uh, of course we we uh, retrieved the situation very quickly but there was a bit of disorder people were wondering is europe still there when we saw germany france uh, they, 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 they were doing things without a lot of coordination. So there's the fact that emotionally, uh, the community of belonging of most Europeans does remain their own country. You mustn't forget that, it's a fact. Then I do indeed believe, and you're right to say this, Europe it was uh, Boris Johnson and the Brexit. That's all it's been for the past months. And we've seen some wonderful things. So that's uh, quite amusing. Uh, uh, Charles Michel just said it. Uh, we acted far, uh, much faster than 2008, 2009, financially speaking, but a wonderful gesture of solidarity. We saw uh, people who were ill uh, being uh, treated in 
uh, in uh, Brussels, in Germany, uh, exchanges of masks. Germany gave masks to Italy. Yes. And so uh, a lot happened and Europe was present. But I think that the reflection is, shouldn't we think that Europe should be a little bit more emotional and effective. When I think about the European uh, conjuncture, I was in Jack Delors' cabinet in uh, 1981, um, almost 40 years ago. So, but uh, the, 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 the market is not enough. Yes, that, what I want to say is that deep down, the effective programme that they were the proudest of is Erasmus, it, because it benefits young people. So it's not just a nice little film that uh, uh, happens in Barcelona, but it shows that, that, that this it's, it's this effective approach that really builds a common house. So that's what Charles Michel was saying really this morning when he said, we must take an interest in the well-being of society. So in fact, this crisis really puts us before this question of well-being, and that's where we have a need to cop a revolution to think about everything that can bring us together. For a long time, the European Union was an economic community. So it's not a, a sin, but that's where its origins lie. It was a European community, and it was a commu uh, the community uh, of, around steel, a big domestic market. Uh, every, everything that's in the economic field are founding elements. But there is lacking a, a dimension to this. What is a European society? I think Charles Michel was saying that the uh, market social economy uh, which it means where it's a market economy, but there is social security, and that's what makes us different from the United States. And we saw this in the COVID crisis. So the emotional heart of Europe is a different relationship between the economy and society. So we're going to have to work on this. However, he said another thing. We must move away from a focus on uh, GDP only. So how are we going to do this? Uh, let's go back to what happened yeah sometimes i wonder about this first what did this reveal i'm very wary of all these people who uh, come with uh, yesterday's recipes uh, uh, for something that covid uh, like, like covid let's really think of what COVID revealed. Let me take an example that's striking for me as a digital company. The uh, uh, overwhelming power of the GAFA. We know that digital technology was very important. Without digital technology, we would have been isolated. It's an essential element of uh, our common uh, life. Zoom, teleconferencing and all. But should Europe uh, rely on U.S. power for its digital uh, life, which is really important for tomorrow? Yes, this crisis revealed, clearly revealed our dependency on, on not just the GAFA, but uh, in production. Uh, the overwhelming power of GAFA is really striking. It, it really, they really control the digital society. And the COVID crisis was like an accelerator for digital technology. And we realized how much digital technology was at the heart of our resilience. And this is today in the hands of the GAFA and large US corporations. Uh, first, the, in the digital area, uh, we have uh, beautiful European champions, but that's more for in European, uh, in professional spheres, such as SAP, Enterprise Technology, and Dassault System. There are beautiful uh, companies, but in daily life for consumers, there's nothing that comes uh, close to Google or Facebook or Amazon. Is it too late? No, no, no. But to develop B2C um, corporations, we need to accept more disruption. I ironically like to say uh, at uh, the age of BFM radio, uh, the explosion engine would have uh, led uh, 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 horse carriage uh, manufacturers to block large cities. <laughs> Because the whole horse um, horsemanship community was upset by the arrival of of, of NG. So, so uh, if we wanted, if we want the European Facebook to emerge, we have to be prepared, or ready, or willing to accept more disruption in our European model. 
I did a lot of reading during the lock lockdown period, and uh, uh, an Italian writer, uh, Alexandro Barrico, who, wrote, who did uh, produced uh, Novocento, he explained that in uh, the problem of anonymity, we have to make a difference between what's uh, intimate, uh, the intimate sphere, and on the other hand, public liberties. Public liberties must be defended very strongly, and the uh, intimate uh, things. If you want to share intimate things on Facebook, that's your right. So there's. Uh, let me go back to the EU. Um, on the one hand, you know, there, there had been the euro crisis, pooling of debt, uh, the club med countries, uh, uh, and so on. Something happened. Despite the Karlsruhe court's decision, uh, Germany said, well, no, we are European, we'll keep going with you. Uh, so there's uh, this uh, deal between the uh, President Macron and Merkel that completely changed the game. When Germany said we are ready to support with com community funds, that's interesting because uh, one listener is asking to us, to us, is asking us, we know that Germany is going to take the chairmanship of the European Union for six months. This development. Uh, will this encourage or foster European cooperation? Is that good news? Germany has changed. Uh, yeah, two things. First, Germany knows that their well-being depends on the green market, the, the European market, and the domestic European market. And they know that if that market uh, uh, failed, uh, it would be a disaster for Germany. So th there's the, the second thing that you have to bear in mind, because it really explains how Germany reacts. Germany is an aging country with a declining demography. Uh, so they, 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 they're like a, a rent country, renter. Uh, well, uh, uh, France is much younger with a more dynamic demography. And uh, so this has an uh, impact on, on mindsets. I like to think that, you know, how would the would Brussels had responded, and if uh, the UK had been part of the UK of the EU? I know that my friend Dominique Strauss-Kahn said, "I'm a Brexiter." He wrote that too. He said that uh, the exit of the UK was a condition to move forward faster, and I think that's what happened. But let's go back to uh, business. The main subject was the challenge to globalization. We realized that we relied on Chinese masks of drugs manufactured in China, such as Dolipan. 70% of ibuprofen comes from China. And we realized that we, that can't be, that's not right. Can we repatriate this manufacturing? Yeah, I'm sure we can. I mean, this is, this manufacturing is pretty automated. I don't think that would come with much of a cost. So we're really going to have to think about what globalization 2.2.0 or, or 3.0 could be. If I had been uh, talking to Charles Michel, I would have asked him the following. We Europeans have transferred the power to negotiate uh, for trade to the European Union. The EU acts on our behalf. And when we see Trump and Xi Jinping fighting against each other and, have, and, and destroying the, the, the w, uh, World uh, Trade Organization. How can Brussels deal with that? Will that have be done between the European Parliament and the European Council? Uh, will business have a, a say on things? Because for us, the way we can produce on a value chain here or there is existential, it's key crucial. Uh, so now we're uh, having to reinvent globalization. And we have to think about that. We, ha we cannot uh, leave the, uh, the outcome of uh, European jobs in the hands of uh, fighting uh, people fighting from China and the US. 
we have a few minutes. You had uh, you, you have a number of proposals to put forth. You said that this crisis should um, allow the massive and non-monetized sharing of medical data across Europe. Second, uh, the Europe of data needs to be built, and we have uh, first-rate European companies who can help that. Uh, we should uh, build a, a credible and, and, and cl European cloud. You say that we should be able to build European champion, and uh, this uh, came up against a special conception of competition in Brussels. So on all these issues, do you think that there is momentum to make them uh, true? Well, for the first point, I'm part of a think tank of European business leaders. It's called the European Down, uh, Roundtable. And we thought that in the consolidation trend, uh, in business consolidation trend, uh, I think mindsets have shifted. We remember that the merger between Alstom and Siemens had been blocked uh, not long ago. And I think on that on this uh, area, mindsets are changing in Brussels. Brussels is realizing that we need uh, major European players. On the subject of data, it's a lot more complex. We had a beautiful uh, European development with GDPR. However, each country has their own philosophy. In France, we have the CNIL. Um, so be after that, there's been uh, uh, some fragmentation trends. Uh, so and these little national uh, data islands are way very little um, compared to Amazon. So we have urgently the need to build a European data space. It will not be as liberal, as free as the European data space. But we need a, a European data policy in the area of health, every, uh, everyone criticizes that the L Data Hub will be operated on the Microsoft base. That's where all the data is co are concentrated. It's a matter of servers. There was no equivalent. Uh, European offering. So the question is not to know whether it's your uh, American servers. The question is whether we're going to have to we're going to have a data policy. Data is going to revolutionize healthcare. So let's not leave this monopoly to China or or the U.S. There was a a book that said like we're we we're the, have the largest population and. Uh, uh, data is the new oil, so will be the Saudi Arabia of the 20th century. We can't let that happen. Uh, intel artificial intelligence, I, I don't really believe in this. Uh, I think there's a conundrum here, uh, artificial and intel in intelligence. But anyway, we need a European policy in this field. We have to work. Uh, digital technology will be the lifeblood of uh, tomorrow's economy, and we cannot live with transfused blood from the US or China. That's a very strong statement. A final point. I hope Charles Michel will hear this. You're going to put these things forth. Um, in the area of healthcare, there is no joint uh, European policy. Yes, that's uh, part of the effective element of Europe that's missing. Our continent is both a market society and also has a welfare state or social security almost everywhere. So what could we do in terms of uh, uh, information, knowledge sharing and solidarity? Yes, this is a important project for your Polar Merlin. Thank you for your participation and thanks to Charles Michel who was present in video conference.